Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful songs that we're singing today. It's so glorious. You know, as a, as a, who knows, she is finding the HDMI cord real quick. There we go. Thank you, man. Thank you. We want to talk about, we want to talk about God's love today. How's that, amen? It's important to, to know about God's love, amen? And I'm not talking about no relativist type of love. I'm not talking about, you know, the type of uh, new age Jesus that everybody wants to paint. We want to talk about real love. God's real love. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And we want to go into some of the nuances of the different processes that are available and alive in understanding God's love and then how that manifests in our life. So in essence, we want to go decode that kind of process of how love then forms into eventually God's joy and how the strength, the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Let's start with John 21. 9 through 15. Let's read together. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes. A hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. This is, of course, the, the famous encounter where Jesus it's his resurrected body, comes and visits the disciples. And here at the bottom, you'll see that's the first time he asks Simon, Peter, if he loves him. And of course, there's three times where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? You know, I think as we are living the completed Testament life, as we're fighting devils and casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead, we also need to come into contact with God's love. Amen? Amen. We also need to get refueled and recharged with His love because we're on the battleground. Amen? We're fighting. We're fighting for truth with spirit and in truth. But we also need to come into contact with what it's all about. This is an interesting scene because this is the scene where after Christ had passed, died, been crucified, been killed as a prisoner of the state, executed as a criminal, and now the disciples are all there at the Sea of Tiberias, well not all, Simon, and they have left the scene of Jerusalem. They have left Jerusalem. They have left the place where Christ had been crucified. And now they've gone back to their lives. They've gone back to their, you know, a different work that they had left behind while following Christ, serving Him three years. Simon Peter went back to fishing. So he went back to his old job. And he's out there fishing, trying to move on in his life from this experience that he had with the Lord for three years. And it was not it was not an easy three years. We know when the time came to the final hour, he denied Jesus three times. 
He was too embarrassed to be with this man from Nazareth. Too embarrassed to say that, yes, I was with Jesus. I am of Jesus. And so he has, you know, sunk his head down into his chest, went back home. He's back fishing. And all of a sudden, all night long, he's fishing. They can't catch anything. And in the morning, they see this man on the shoreline. And they know it's, they see that it's Jesus. And Simon, the Bible says he was naked. He put on his uh, raiment and jumps into the sea. He casts himself into the sea. But he sees Christ on the beach. He's that elated. And then what's interesting about this scene is that Christ calls him and doesn't say anything about the denials that she, that Peter did. I mean, this is the man where Jesus said, upon this rock I shall build my church. He had blessed him, given him such a mighty, mighty blessing. And now at the final hour, he denied Christ three times. He had chance and chance to, to say, yes, I'm with him, and to stand in faith and stand in strength. But instead, he stood in cowardice, shaking the atmosphere of others around him, fear of persecution, fear of belittlement, etc., whatever it may be. And now this man knows in his heart he is distraught. He knows that he betrayed Christ. He knew he knows he denied him. Even he knows the prophecy that Jesus spoke over him that he will deny him came true. He feels so like a traitor that he betrayed the Son of God. And it's interesting because when Jesus calls him to the shore, he says, come and dine with me. He says, come and eat. And it's interesting because he pulls up the nets and he gets 153 fish. 153, that's pretty close to 154. (laughs) 154 is the minute and hour Father passed. So it's interesting that there's all these fish that Jesus had miraculously given to them by grace. And they come up onto the shore and they are, look at, look at, look at what the scripture says. It says, none of them even asked, who are you? Because they knew who he was. They took bread, they eat with him, and then Jesus asks him. He asks him these three He asks him three times, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because Peter denied him three times. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He lets Peter indemnify, step into, and acknowledge that he has committed sin, that he has fallen from grace. And he doesn't, he asks him, Do you love me? That's the question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Will you stand for me when it's not popular? Will you stand for me when everybody wants to persecute you? Amen. In that hour, you may have been weak, but I give you, I ask you again, do you love me? Or do you love Yourself, your reputation, your social networks, your whatever it is. And I look at this scene and I I see, I see such a powerful picture. Because in this hour too, we are also facing that exact situation. We have people for whatever reason now, who have been wanting to run from the truth. But now that we're talking about the truth, they have to confront it. Whether they like it or not, they have to confront it. They can no longer say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going to follow without a brain, without a, without a mind, without a heart. Because that's where my social networks go. Because that's what is popular. Because that is what we will, what will not give me any persecution or put any ripples in my waves in my life. Amen. (laughs) 
And meanwhile, God is asking, do you love me? What's amazing about this is that when he asks that, and Peter is convicted by the Holy Spirit, he knows Jesus is asking him that because he denied him and he was a coward to stand up for him at the final hour that he looked and preserved his own life more than God's. And he is convicted with the Holy Spirit. And this time he says, yes, Lord, I love you. He goes on from this place to then drop everything. He drops everything. And he goes out to preach about Christ. He knows he's going to die. And eventually he's crucified upside down because he feels that he is unworthy to be crucified right side up. You see, when God asks you, do you love me? This is the reaction that a true believer gave. It is not a reaction of, oh yes, I love you and that's it. He then stepped forward and gave his life. He risked it all. He realized that he could not live in cowardice and in fear, but that he would have to live in the strength of God's love and press forward into danger, into risk, into certain death. And this is really what you see. You see a whole, the whole world church. You see people who are just wanting to ignore the issue because it's more comfortable. It doesn't mess up with their frame of reference or comfort zone. You have a whole other group who are just sitting there, lukewarm, watching. Which one will, which side will we jump on? Which side will be more politically expedient? Which side? These are, of course, what Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out. This is the time where it becomes clear where you stand, what you believe. It becomes very clear what you believe. If you believe, Father, Christ was some kind of peace activist, we, we usually say God of, the God of the shalom. And shalom means peace. The deep meaning of shalom is not peace. It is completeness. The meaning of shalom means completing, completeness. He is a God of completeness. And in that completeness, there is peace, there is righteousness, there is joy, there is abundance. Amen? But it was interesting because when I was praying about the love of God and if we are filled with the love of God that we can face death, certain defeat and we can stand in strength, a supernatural power that is not human. Amen? Normally in the flesh we would buckle under that kind of persecution or pressure, but because we stand in the love of God and we are willing to give our life for Him, just like Peter, to die for Him, we are filled with the supernatural power. I was wondering, what is the connection between that? How is it that when we experience the love of God, then we receive a supernatural power. And I was looking at Chen Sung Young the other day. And Father was writing that he said, he said, what is it that God regrets? It is that humanity inherited a false lineage. You inherited false blood. Satan is the origin of this. He always wants to create havoc with all things of creation. You are connected to such a universe, such rights of ownership, and such a lineage. The source of all these five functions, what you see, think, smell, say, touch, belong to the satanic side. When we see this, we usually just think lineage. 
But that word ownership is so important to understand. You know, Father said that God is the true system. So Cham Sikhs that means the true teacher and the true chewing, which means the true owner. He is a true owner. We talked about last week the ethics of ownership. You see, because when we live our life, it's we're gonna give our life to something. You have to be owned by something, whether you like it or not. You're going to be owned by this ideology, you're going to be owned by that ideology, you're going to be owned by relativism, feminism, whatever it is. You are going to bow down to something and be a be owned by that in your life. Whether it's money, knowledge, power, whatever, whether it's your success, whether it's your own self-narcissism, whatever it is, you will bow to something in your life. Amen? Amen. You will. It's unavoidable. You will live your life for something. And the real task is to understand how is ownership connected to God's love for us. See, I believe that when we surrender to God's love, then we are also surrendering to His right of ownership the Father's talking about. We're surrendering to His right of ownership, which is already His, but we are acknowledging it and we are freely choosing to come under His dominion through the active action of surrendering to God. And when we come into that surrendering to God, acknowledging that He owns us, that we are His, to put it in a more colloquial way, that He owns us, then we are in a, pro- we have a protection that God puts around us immediately. Because anything that God loves and owns, He protects. Just like anything you love and own, you protect. Amen? And that is where the power of God's protection comes when we surrender to His ownership and to His love. There is a power, the Bible talks about the hedge of protection that surrounds us. And I remember one time we were doing Bible study, somebody asked, how how does God, does God really judge us? You know, and then burn us? And I said, God has a hedge of protection. When your the, the gentleman had chickens, he raises chickens. So I said, when your chickens leave the coop, are you judging them? When they get eaten by a wolf? They have left the hedge of protection and the predators are there to devour them. Amen. They have left that hedge of love and ownership. And it is not even the owner that has to condemn them. They are eaten by the predators because they have left the hedge of protection. Amen. Amen. It is so important. We're going to surrender ourselves to something. Whether it's some kind of civil rights, uh, you know, movement. Whether it's some kind of you know, uh, personal investment we're doing, whether it's our family, whether it's our self, whether it's self-pity, whatever it is, you're going to surrender to something. You have to surrender to something in your life. I don't care who you are, you are going to surrender to art, to video games, whatever it is. You're going to surrender to something. Your life will be lived for something. But all those paths are empty paths, and they do not lead to your shalom, your completeness. Because your completeness and your shalom can only come from the Creator. It's the only one. It's the only path. The more we rebel and run from that, the more pain we will feel. Because we don't want to surrender to God's ownership. We don't want to feel like a possession, even though when we get married and we're lovey-dovey, we want to say, you belong to me and I belong to you. (laughs) 
we get hung up on the fact that we are going to be, or we stay oblivious to the fact that we are going to be possessed by something. And we choose so many other things in life, trying to believe and make ourselves believe that they're not possessing us, that we're in control and our life spins out of control. Amen? Amen. But when we come into the surrendering to the true owner, to the true owner, look at these, these five functions, the five senses can be taken back from the dominion of Satan. What we used to see was what Satan wanted to see. What we used to taste is what Satan wanted to taste. What we used to smell here is what Satan wanted to hear and taste and touch. But when we come under the ownership of God and surrender to His ownership, God can start reclaiming those spiritual senses as well. He can start giving us now supernatural power in our senses. He can start opening new dimensions of vision, face-to-face encounter, meetings with God, hearing God's voice, all the things that the prophets in the Scripture lived, saw, and breathed with, we come into His presence. I love it. It said, one preacher I heard said, When God told Moses, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground, he was saying, take off your past life. Take it off. Take off the sandals of your flesh and live in the burning spirit, the burning bush, the burning power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Take off the sandals of carnality and live in the power and authority of, Of the Spirit of God. Woo! My, my. (laughs) My, my. I was praying about what is it? What is the difference? Because we do, you know, God does love the saint and the sinner. He will go after the publican and the prostitute just as much as He will go after the churchgoer. Amen? Amen? So what is the difference between having God's love and whether or not it gives him joy or not? And the Bible says in Matthew 3, 17, he says, when I go to heaven, right? I want God to be there and say, my true and faithful servant in whom I am well pleased. There is a connection between God's love and pleasing God. Being pleasing to God. That is connected with His joy. If you have children, you know that you will love the saint and the sinner in your family. (laughs) You will love the one that strays and the one that stays. But there is a difference because some may please you, you may be proud of those children, and that will give you joy. On the other hand, it's the same God's love is there. God's love is there for even those who betray Him and walk away from Him and walk into hell out of arrogance and of their own volition. But when they live that type of rebellious Life against God, when they desecrate Him, and this is what's happening with the church hierarchy now, desecrating Father, desecrating Him, des- you know, stepping on top of Him, erasing Him. This is, God's love is still there, but when He's not pleased, that leads to suffering. His love is still there. But when He's not pleased, when we are doing things that are against His commandments, against His words, we're showing that we really don't love Him. We're showing that we are just receiving His love. We want to be thieves of His love, receive the benefits of His love, but have no give and receive, no more, no giving to God. No returning that 
love that we receive to have God feel joy. And this is when we harm God. This is when we harm Him. God's love is still there for the saint and the sinner. God's love is still there. It is available. But because they step away from it, refuse to bow before it, surrender to it, it causes God suffering and pain, agony, heartache. And this is what we will see. Because in a whole, in a church, we have all these relativists that want to say, Oh, what about God's love? Why aren't you loving like God? No, we are loving like God. That's why we tell you the truth. Because we love you and we fear for your soul is the reason why we tell you the truth. And don't lie to you with honey covered words to just make you feel warm and cuddly inside. We want you to be real with God. Because He is real. He's not ice cream candy and cotton candy. He's real. He's real. It's such an interesting because look, look at what stays consistent. It stays consistent in there. God's love is right there and God's love is right there. That doesn't change. But look at this, the pleasing, whether or not that individual is living a life that is honoring God, uplifting His commandments, trying their best, imperfectly, yes, but trying their best to serve Him and bring Him joy. That is the difference. And that is one who is acknowledging His ownership over me And because God owns me and I am His, it is my love obligation to return joy to Him by being pleasing to Him. Amen? Amen. As an object, it is my obligation, my love obligation to return beauty to Him, to be all that He desires for me as an object to be, and to return that to Him, and to let Him be glorified in that. But God's love doesn't change. I remember on the uh, 421, four rainbow blessing, returning to the true Father's authority, there was this four rainbows that appeared. And what I felt was not only that Father loves us, But the Father is pleased with us. Amen. When His authority came back. And I think that's very important because we're fighting a battle and we're in combat against the devil. And many of us here are actually on the front lines, you know, having battles and skirmishes. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And it's important... That in the midst of all that, we remember how much God loves us. It is important for us to remember that. Because we can gain, we can lose sight of that in pursuit of the achiever, and we can forget to be a receiver. Amen? I'm not saying not achieving is bad. It's important to achieve for God. Amen? But we don't do what we do because because of uh, we don't it's not because who we are dictates what we do it's not the opposite way around it's not we do something to become something who we are dictates what we do and because we're the beloved of Christ that is the reason why we stand for him in the final hour even though it's tough and even though we get persecuted But in the midst of that, it is also so important to remember God loves me. Because we can forget. Amen? We can forget in the midst of battle that God loves me and He is pleased with me. You know, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the three-day ceremony. We've been talking about the six marriages, whatever whatever the situations they are, we talked about them. And what's so interesting is that, unfortunately, it is in a situation 
where the church hierarchy, of course, is surrounding mother, and mother herself believes that she saved father from his physical weaknesses. But really, it's the other way around. See, this is what she doesn't realize. Father saved her continuously. In fact, the three-day ceremony itself was a salvation for her. Because it was through the three-day ceremony that all the brides of Christ could be one with Christ through the clothing of Christ upon the husband. And so that each one of the brides would be with Christ through the three-day ceremony. It was a salvation. It was a gift from heaven that was given to mother so that she the, the carnal feelings... And the physical feelings or the, the personal feelings of pain she might have felt would be liberated. And that is why the three-day ceremony is critical to receiving the blessing. Especially for first gen, amen? Critical. Absolutely critical. I remember one time... You know, Kuk Jin Hyung, I'm just, we're just so grateful. Let's give a big round of applause for my brother here. I'm just so grateful for him. You know what he said to me? He said something to me that blew my mind. He said something that blew my mind. This was a couple years back. And this was after Father had crowned me and all that kind of thing. And, and father, my brother came to me and he, this is what he said to me. He said, I know how much Father loves me. By seeing how much He loves you. That blew my mind. Here I am. Father just gave His whole inheritance to me. And His whole kingdom. Crowned me three times. And and He comes to me and He says, I feel Father's love when I see Him love you. I never received that love. But when I see Him love you, I feel His love for me. That blew my mind. If you have children, you know, or if you have siblings, you know, how much rivalry there is for a parent's attention. (laughs) But here was a man who should be angry at me, (laughs) who should want to kill me, Because because my father passed his whole inheritance to me. And here he is saying, I can feel his love by how much he loves you. I was blown away. When I heard that, I didn't, it didn't, but as I, through the years, I've thought about that. I realized that truly is the heart of true surrendering to God's ownership. Into God's love. That is true surrendering. And I think about our whole situation. I even think about mother's situation. And how father would spend time with members, speak with them 10 10 hours, 12 hours. And she would be very upset because he promised he'd be done in two hours. (laughs) And it doesn't only happen once or twice. It happens all the time. So she gets a little unnerved in her carnal, in the, in the carnal, in the flesh, you know? She gets angry. You promised two hours. How can you speak for, how can you be with members, you know, speak with them for 15 hours? You know? You promised you'd be at brec- at the breakfast table. The breakfast is cold now and you can't eat. You know, all this kind of thing. These are real. This happened in our house. But I realize just like a true elder brother surrenders to God's ownership and can say to his younger who has received all this blessing that he has not merited but has been given to him and he can say to that younger not you little I'm going to whoop you to tomorrow but he can say to him I feel Father's love for me when I see how much he loves you You see, if 
When all those times, I realize now, all those times when Father was with the members, this is probably, you know, in different, uh, this is in different countries, so this is like the last time they may even see him. And it was at a situation where after decades and decades, so many archangels had surrounded Mother, encouraging her in that type of thinking. But if she saw when Father was giving Himself to the members and giving Himself to all the brothers and sisters, the children of God, and she said, you know what, I feel His love for me when I see how much He loves you. If she would say that, if she could repeat that in her mind, if she was surrounded by people who are not trying to exploit her and use her to gain money and power, but by real people, who encouraged her in the Spirit and the Word, and she had that type of mind. Think about that. How different that would be. She said, look at how much He loves our brothers and sisters. That's how much He loves me. Because that's a reflection of how much He loves me. It could have been empowering. It could have been strengthening. It could have built her up spiritually. It could have given her anointing and authority and spiritual power by just that frame of reverence that she held. Instead of saying, broke another promise, breakfast getting cold, lunch getting cold, no time for me. And I feel that in the final hour, God is asking us, and He is truly asking us, I want to pour out my love on you. But how will you stand? How will you stand in the final hour? Will you stand for me? Will you give your life for me? Not just in words. Are you willing to die for me? Just like Peter was. And God is asking us that. Because I believe that as we are standing strong for God and we are being persecuted from left and right and people around the world who are standing for God are being persecuted left and right, we have to realize God loves us. That He loves you who are standing for Him. And the key, the next key is that He is pleased with us as we stand for Him. He also loves the sinner. But He is displeased when they desecrate Him. Amen? So I believe it's important at this time that we have to be able to experience God's love. We have to be able to experience the love of God even while we're in battle. And that's not some kind of flaky relativist thing that means means just say, oh, love your enemy and then cut their head off. No, that's not what it means. (laughs) You know? Or love your enemy as they're pillaging and raping you you and uh, destroying you. No, that's not what it means. We have a right to stand for God. It is our duty to stand for God in the final hour. And it is our duty to stand against predators who are coming in to the, what do you call it? The chicken's hen, what is it, the, the coop, the hen house. We have a duty, protection. You know, I just feel so strong that Father wants to encourage those who are risking their lives for Him now. Because I know it goes in waves, and sometimes we feel high, but sometimes we feel real low. And sometimes it's invigorating, and sometimes it is tiring. But I know one thing. I want to be the type of son when I stand in front of my father, that he says, my son, you have been faithful and I am well pleased with you. I want to be that type of son. I want to be that type of son. Even though I lose everything, even though I have nothing, I want to be that type of son that he can see and look at and say, 
I'm pleased with you, my boy. I just want to encourage everybody out there who is standing and fighting the good fight, who is coming under a tremendous persecution. I want to encourage you. God loves you so much. He gave his life for you and also the sinners. But he's pleased with what you're doing. You're standing up for him in the final hour when it really counts. You're standing up for him when everybody is taking the easy route and stepping on him. Because it is what everybody else is doing. And it's where the herd moves. We are the ones who stand for him at the risk of losing everything because of one simple thing, and that's because we love him. That's it. I want to personally also thank all the brothers and sisters who are out there, and of course all of you. I'm just, you know, it is an honor for me to stand with you in this very tumultuous time. It's a great honor. Because I get to stand with people of true faith who believe in Christ and not are just churchgoers or herd followers but real people of God, warriors of Christ, who know right from wrong and who want to please God. And I thank you for that because it is an honor to walk with those kind of people. It is an honor. And I truly pray that Father would pour out His love on us today. Um, you want to share something on that? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of everybody, I'll give him a hug, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. They know, Papa. I didn't say give you a plot, but they all give you a plot anyway. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I think about Father, I have to be honest with you. He is, he is a scary man. So I was like, but, oh yeah, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. He, he was kind of scary. So I was always like, uh, behind the back, send my husband in front and, I bet you go ahead and, you know, you do that and I'm, I'm always the rather behind. <laughs> Cause he, he was scary. And he had immense spiritual power, as you remember. And many of uh, our first gen, they were matched by father because they knew, they, they really knew and they believed that father would know, um, them more than themselves, right? So father can even see the whole spirit world and whole ancestry behind this person for, for us. That's why he, he can match for us. That's, that's what our first gen truly believed. And it was true. And, and I remember one sister was uh, making a testimony, and she said uh, um, she had a dream. And then she saw Father at the bottom of the ocean. It was so dark, but Father was at the bottom of the ocean. And she was like, she was so shocked. And, oh, what happened to Father? And and she had a chance to go to Hundoke, but Father um, father had a Hundoke, and she went there. And then Father was in the middle of a Hundoke reading Father's words, and he stopped, and he said, uh, I was at the bottom of the ocean because I was wrestling with the axis of the earth. And he looked at, looked at her eyes. And she dropped her jaw, she said. Oh, my gosh, I didn't even ask him, but he answered my question. She was like so surprised, she said. And she said, uh, you know what? Even though we don't ask him. He already knows our question. That's why sometimes in the Hundoke, you know, Father goes around, changes the topic. But you know what? Father was answering all those people in the sea. That's what he was, she was testifying. You know, that testimony only adds to my fear toward Father, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, and indeed, in Proverbs says, um, the beginning of all the wisdom is knowing the fear of God, right? It is so true. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, it's so true. You know, we just, uh, um, today I'm, I'm hearing my, my husband's message. It just uh, brought me so much tear because I feared God so much, Father so much. I don't know if that was the reason, but he gave our couple so much blessing. I mean, he chose my husband as a successor. How can we ask more than that, right? And he told our couple as the uh, couple that heaven loves. So, you know, we can, the immense blessing that we got was just uh, so amazing. But it's so easy when we get a lot of blessing, then loving God and be joyous to God is very easy, right? But the problem and test comes <laughs> when God told you to do things that you don't want to do. When it sounds like us, that sounds like sometimes it's like things that gives you trouble and God asks you to do it. We had to, um, when we were in Korea and doing the mega church, a couple thousand people were attending every Sunday and we had to drop everything and then we had to go and attend Father. That was a very difficult question. Difficult decision, but as we do it, there was more blessing came. We could attend Father personally, and it the final hour. When we come to here to Pennsylvania and drop everything, all the position and all everything we have, all the reputation, that was difficult, difficult, difficult thing. And we did not want to. I personally did not want to do it, but we come here, and then I got to know our Father more deeply than I ever imagined that I can that I can have. This personal relationship that I found with Father was so immense. And at times it felt like a, it's like almost like a curse, almost like a father is punishing me. But Father had a better plan. Brothers and sisters, just like a job was tested by Satan in approval of God, we are tested. And we are many times, we are put through difficult situation. But I realize, you know, uh, Father, just like the many times, a couple of times I shared you, Father slept us, you know, slept our cheeks <laughs> um, in Nigeria. But Father was actually after the test, he concerned about us. He concerned about me. You can't hold any grudge, any any resentment towards you. And I said, same. I think it's the same thing about God too. He tests us. He puts us sometimes difficult thing, but He truly concerns us. He truly loves us, brothers and sisters. When He sees us standing strong, even though it's difficult. And that love, that test becomes his love. And you know what today, brothers and sisters, let us stand strong and testify his love in the midst of that good. Ah, true. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Amma. Let's take this time. Let's look at Chun Sung real quick. And I want to really go 309. Let's read together. Only true love can influence our motivation, our course, or the end of our life. Human beings were born of love, so they must live for love and even die for love at the end of their lives. Amen. Amen. I just want you to stay in your seats. And uh, let's just close our eyes right now. I just want to take time right now to be in the presence of God. Many times we invite God's presence, but we don't know how to have Him stay. Many times we're just trying to achieve for Him, and He's wanting to give, but we're not receiving. So I just want to take this time right now to receive from God, because in the midst of battle, we also have to replenish our nutrients 
and our love that God is filling us with. Amen. Umak jom chizayo. Let's take this time. Father, we thank you so much. God, we know you love us so much. Because, Father, you said, Blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness sake. For theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. And, Father, we know that we are so blessed. We are blessed to stand for righteousness sake. Not self-righteousness, Lord but for you, because you are perfect righteousness. You are perfect shalom, peace, and completeness. You are perfect perfection. And Father, we want to come into your presence today, but Father, many times as we battle the demons and devils in our life, and those armies that are coming against us, it is so easy to lose sight of how much you love us. How much you are pleased with us for fighting the good fight. So Father, we thank you right now for loving us so much. For giving your life on the cross over and over again. So that we would be free and live in liberty in your spirit. Father, we come in contact with your love. We want to surrender to your ownership and your dominion. And Father, we... Ask that the Holy Spirit fill us right now. It doesn't have to come in a super spectacular way. It could come in a smooth wave of the Spirit over us. And Father, we are dropping our expectations of wanting you to show up with lightning and thunder. And we just want to be there in your presence, however humble or meek it may be. Father, we want to notice you right now in our heartbeat that is beating right now, which is the grace of life you've given. We want to notice your presence in the breath that we're taking in right now because that is your grace. We could have died last night. We want to notice you in the sensations that we have in our senses right now. And we want to claim those senses and all our spiritual senses under your ownership, Lord. You own our spirit. You own us, Father. And we are pleased to be there. Father, we pray that you would unlock those senses so we could feel the power of your rejuvenating love and your grace that is real and alive in our lives. And Father, as we step forward on the battlefield to stand for you against those who are Standing against you, we always pray that we would remember to bring you joy. To bring you joy. To bring you joy as our purpose. Father, we pray that we would be those who stand in that anointing. And we pray and we thank you for all the things you are doing and all the re-strengthening and refueling that you are giving us now. Because, Father, without you, we are nothing. But with you, we are everything. We thank you, Lord, and give you all the praise, glory, and honor. And we report these in all of our names, and we pray this in your holy name. Amen and adju. Let's give God some praise, everybody. Let's rise up and hug your neighbor, encourage them this day, and tell them, stand strong, because God's love is right there, right there. God bless you.